I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend His cause. Maintain the honors of His word, the glory of His cross. A couple weeks ago in our year-end review, I told you that for some reason or another, I missed preaching a letter from Philippians when we were going through the New Testament. So with that in mind, you would, if you would, turn in your Bibles to the book of Philippians. We're going to be discussing Philippians chapter 3 this morning. We're go this is going to be a lengthy reading, so if you want to turn to Philippians chapter 3, we're going to start reading at verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the real circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, uh, yeah, sorry, if anyone has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in, faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may obtain the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already attained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with the mind set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. This letter is written to the church in Philippi. Assuming that people haven't moved, this church would contain people like Lydia and her household, the Philippian jailer and those in his household, as well as many others who converted to Christ that we don't read of in the book of Acts. They were fairly wealthy. As Philippians 4.15 tells us, they supported Paul financially in spreading the gospel. But like every church in the first century, they were confronted with the, doc with the doctrinal difference that arose from people who convert converted from Judaism. That being adherence to the law of Moses, especially the practice of circumcision. Now to us today, this might not look like that big of a deal. For who really cares whether or not a male has been physically circumcised? But to a Jew, this was a very big deal. For physical circumcision was a sign of the covenant between God and Abraham, a sign to the Jews that they were the covenant people of God. This covenant was made about 400 years before the law of Moses was even instituted. It was instituted all the way back in Genesis 17. In Genesis 17, 9 to 14, we read, And God said to Abraham, Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep. Between me and you and your offspring after you, every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. 
He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from my people. He has broken my covenant. This last phrase in verse 14 sums up how the Jews viewed circumcision. If the male wasn't circumcised, he had broken God's covenant and was therefore not in a covenant relationship with God. Now here you have, fast forward a bit, 2,000 years, and you have preachers like Paul going around and teaching the, the Gentiles that they could be in a covenant relationship with God without being physically circumcised. What blasphemy, many Jews thought. For some, that the fact that the Gentiles could be saved at all was bad enough, but now they don't even have to be circumcised or follow the law of Moses? That can't be what God means. So this question of circumcision really boils down to how are people saved? How are Jews? How are Gentiles saved? Are they saved by following the law of Moses and being circumcised, like many Jews said? Or are they saved by obedient faith in Christ, like Paul said? Now, Paul, of course, gives us the answer in verses 8 and 9 of Philippians 3. So we read verses 8 and 9 of Philippians 3. Indeed, I count everything as lost because the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, in that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God from God that depends on faith. We are not saved by the law. The law in this chapter being the law of Moses. Nor are we saved by fleshly rituals like circumcision. We are saved by faith in Christ, the one who died on the cross for our sins, the one who was raised from the dead. Paul even goes on to say that we, meaning the saved, are the real circumcision, the ones truly in a covenant relationship with God, having cut off our former sins by obedience to Christ in baptism, being raised to walk in newness of life. So going back to Philippians 3, 2 and 3, he reminds them to beware of, false, of the false doctrine of salvation by physical circumcision, and for that reason, not to put confidence of their salvation in the flesh, for it isn't there. To prove his point, Paul states that if glorying in the flesh is what saved a person, he would be able to glory the most because he was circumcised the eighth day. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Pharisee according to the law. And as for his zeal, he persecuted the church. And as for his righteousness, he was blameless under the law of Moses, meaning that he sought to keep it perfectly, even though he admitted in other places that he did not do so. All of this glory, however, Paul counted as rubbish or garbage, because again, we're not saved by the flesh, but by faith in Christ. Without this faith, we will never obtain the resurrection of the dead, which in this context means salvation in heaven. All of this brings us to a peculiar statement Paul made in verse 12 of Philippians 3. Philippians 3 verse 12 says, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Connecting verses 11 and 12, we can know that Paul is saying that he had not yet obtained the resurrection of the dead, or salvation in heaven yet. Now, someone may be listening in the audience might be asking, but isn't Paul a Christian? Isn't he saved when he wrote this letter? And that, of course, depends on what you mean by the word saved. You see, the Bible uses salvation in two senses. One is backward-looking, and one is forward-looking. When we hear the gospel, believe it, and obey it by repenting of our sins and being baptized for the remission of our sins, we are saved from our past sins. 
That's what verses like Romans 5 verse 1 says. Romans 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you catch what Paul said in that verse? Since we have been justified. That justification has already occurred to those who Paul was writing the letter to the Romans to, which was the Romans. How were they justified? By faith. A faith that obeys. What would this justification by faith lead the Romans to have? Present peace with God through Jesus Christ. It is only through Jesus that we can have peace. And the only reason this peace is possible is because Jesus died on the cross in the first place. Skipping down to verse 6 of Romans 5, we read, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were the enemies, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. So summing this all up, when our faith obeys Christ in baptism, we are saved from our past sins. In that God has washed away our past sins in the blood of Christ. No matter what we've done in the past, God has washed those sins away. But here's where people start to fall off the rails a little bit. They think that obeying Jesus means that all of our future sins are automatically forgiven as well. Therefore, assuring us of a home in heaven, a home that can never be lost. That doctrine is one that the scriptures simply don't teach. Turn if you would to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, we're going to read verses 5 to 10. 1 John 1, beginning at verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, for the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the word is not in us. There is a quick question that we need to answer before we examine this passage, which is, who is John writing this letter to? Usually when reading an epistle, we get a clear sense from the opening verses as to who the audience is, but not so with this book. However, if you read the epistle, it becomes clear that John is writing to Christians and not those who are not Christians. He uses the phrase little children seven times in the book, a personal phrase that would only be used by John to speak to those in Christ. But more convincingly, 1 John 3, 1 says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God, and so we are. The people, of, the people John is writing to, he considers children of God. And such can only be the case if one has in faith obeyed Jesus and had their past sins washed away. And going back to 1 John 1, John is telling Christians, if, to, if they say that they have no sin, they are deceiving themselves, and the truth is not in them. How can this be true if Christ has washed away all of our past, present, and future sins? An unavoidable truth is that it can't. Christ's blood has washed away all of our past sins, the ones that we've committed before becoming a Christian, but that does not mean that all of our future sins are automatically washed away. How are the sins we committed after baptism cleansed? Well, according to 1 John 1, 9, these sins are confessed in prayer to God. As Christians, we need to remember the power that prayer has. Not only does it provide us a way to talk to God and ask God for help in our lives and for the things we need in this life, it provides us a way to ask for the forgiveness of our sins. And we need to be asking for the forgiveness of our sins when none of us can say 
that we don't sin. What will happen if we don't pray for the forgiveness of sins? Well, the obvious conclusion is we won't be forgiven. We won't be cleansed of those sins. And we, we will be putting the risk of our future salvation in heaven at risk. That's because the scriptures use salvation in a second sense as well. A salvation that is yet ahead. The salvation in heaven. In Romans 13, 11, Paul writes, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. If these Romans, the same Romans who we read about earlier, had, who had been justified or saved from their past sins by faith in Christ, if these Romans had already been completely saved, how can their salvation be nearer to them now than when they first believed? The answer is it couldn't, unless this salvation isn't the same salvation talked about in other verses in the book of Romans or other places in the Bible. To find out what salvation Paul is talking about in Romans 13, we can compare with other books. 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. What's out, what is the salvation that Paul is talking about in Romans 13 and Peter is talking about in 1 Peter 1? It is not salvation from sin. It is salvation in heaven. Just like salvation from sin, salvation in heaven is also contingent on faith. But since salvation in heaven is still in the future, this salvation is contingent on continued faith. That's what Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received in which you stand and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you unless you believed in vain. In that passage we just read, there's that pesky word, if. That means that whatever comes before if is conditional based on what comes after if. The Corinthians were being saved, in other words, going to heaven, if they hold fast to the word of God. But if they didn't hold fast, they would stop being saved, for they would have given up their faith. And that's what Paul is really getting at in Philippians chapter 3, going all the way back to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. He has not obtained salvation in heaven yet, because he was still alive on this earth. Therefore, he must press on to the goal of obtaining it. In English, the word press can mean different things depending on the context. It can mean to squeeze something together. It can mean to try hard to persuade someone of something. It could mean a large crowd, a press. Or it can mean a device used in printing, the printing press. But in this context, in Philippians 3, it doesn't mean any of those things. For verse 12, in verse 12, it means to continue to move forward in a forceful, steady, and determined way. Paul hadn't achieved salvation in heaven yet, but he was going to be determined that he would move forward so he could. Why would Paul have to move forward with such a determination? Because becoming a Christian and remaining a Christian, living for Christ, is not easy. It's Hard. Jesus describes following him as being on the narrow way. In Matthew 7, 13 and 14, we read, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. The center aisle in front of this pulpit is pretty wide. Nobody really has difficulty coming up and down the aisle as they choose. However, if I was to ask Jeff and Tim and Annie and Henry and Shudong to take their seats and move it closer to the people on this side of the room, while at the same time leaving a center aisle, things would be a little different. Now we have a narrower aisle likely causing people to trip and fall off the aisle 
as they went back and forth to the front and the back. It's harder to walk in a narrow aisle than it is a wider aisle. But that narrow aisle, that narrow road is the one that leads to the narrow door in heaven. The reason the road is so narrow is because in order to be on the road, we have to be willing to change our lives from a life of sin, you know, one that submits to Christ. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Repentance means that we look at our life of sin and determine no longer to live like that, but will change our lives to be more like Christ. To be more like Christ means that I have to submit to the will of Christ. Paul said in Ephesians 5, 24, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. This verse is often used to teach about wives submitting to their husbands, but let's not miss the point. It also says the church, the saved people, must submit to Christ in everything. Submission means that I put aside my will in order to follow someone else's will. Something that society on the whole makes fun of, refuses to accept, and says it is demeaning and degrading to men and women. It is not demeaning or degrading in any way. Submission is simply accepting order. However, true submission is never forced. It is done willingly out of love, and in this case, love for Christ. Submission to Christ is exactly what the song All of Self and None of Thee that we sometimes sing in our books, that's what that song is teaching. When we're outside of Christ, we're all about ourselves and could care less about what God thinks. But then when we hear a little bit of something about Jesus, it can cause us to change a little, to where now it's some of self and some of Jesus. That little something we might have heard could intrigue us, and we begin to learn a little bit more. And that causes us to change ourselves again, to where it's less of self and more of Jesus. But as we continue to learn still and continue to study, we realize that God will not accept us in pride. And so we decide to put our stubbornness and our will totally away and change our lives completely to where it is not about self and all about Jesus. It's this type of attitude that leads a person to obey God in baptism and be faithful after baptism. Because it's this type of attitude that really realizes that without God and His love, we cannot be saved. And so that I must do all things to conform to Christ. Putting away our pride, our stubbornness, and willingly submit to Christ and walk on the narrow road is hard, but it is necessary if we want to be saved. But changing conformity to Christ aren't the only reasons why being a Christian is hard, for being a Christian often involves facing persecution and hardship. Listen to the trials of Paul in 2 Corinthians 11, 21 to 28, and ask yourselves, would I be willing to suffer these things for Christ? like Paul did. First, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 21 begins, To my shame I must say, we were too weak for that, but whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking as a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from these things, there is the daily pressure of me, of my anxiety for all the churches. That's quite a list. As a child, I, did, I never liked being spanked when I did something wrong. But I never received 39 lashes on my back, nor was I ever beaten with a rod. 
I can't imagine what that would feel like. And if I had a choice, I don't want to know. But if someone came marching through the back door with a gun and shot anyone who wouldn't renounce Christ, would we be willing to die? Or would we deny Christ in order to save our life? That's a tough question. But our answer will tell us if we are a true follower of Christ or just a fair-weather Christian, a Christian who is only a Christian as long as times are good. Paul suffered all of these things, all of these terrible things, and he and the other apostles tell us that we may be treated similarly. Yet in all of the things we just looked at, one might expect Paul to be a bitter man because of the type of life Christ demanded of him. But that's not Paul at all. For going back to Philippians chapter 3, how does he begin the chapter? Rejoice in the Lord. You might say, I don't understand. How can we rejoice with all of these terrible things happening to us? We can rejoice in the Lord. Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In Christ, Christians have been blessed with all spiritual blessings. Not some spiritual blessings, not a couple spiritual blessings, but all spiritual blessings. We have been saved from our past sins that we have committed before we became a Christian. We have the right to petition God in prayer, and we know that God will hear our prayers. We have the church that Jesus Christ established so that we can grow in the truth, encourage others to grow, and be encouraged by others as well. And we have the Word of God, the words that will lead us along the narrow path. We can rejoice in all of these blessings that Christ has given us. But perhaps most of all, we can rejoice that Christ has blessed us with the hope of heaven if we remain faithful. That's the goal that Paul is pressing towards. That's what he wants to obtain, salvation in heaven. As I've said many times, the scriptures don't give us many pictures of heaven, but it does give us a couple. The 1 Peter 1 verse 4, a verse we've read earlier, but we'll read again. 1 Peter 1 verse 4, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfaithful, kept in heaven for you. <clears throat> Our inheritance is imperishable, meaning that it will not die and will not decay. Our inheritance is undefiled, meaning that nothing bad will stain it or make it less perfect. And our inheritance is unfading, meaning that it will be forever. Where is our inheritance kept? It's kept in heaven, waiting for us if we are faithful. In Titus 1, verses 1 and 2, our final verse this morning, Paul writes, Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of faith, for the sake of the faith of God's elect, and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. God has promised those who obey his Son a reward, a reward that is obtained through faith. Will walking by faith at times be difficult? Yes. But in Philippians chapter 3, Paul reminds us that we can joyfully live the life Christ wants us to live because we have Paul's example and the example of other faithful Christians that we can follow. He reminds us that our walk with Christ, that we need to hold true to the right path. The one that will lead us to the goal, for our citizenship is in heaven, a place we will live if we faithfully press on in the Lord. I'm not ashamed to.